I, I just want to say that, just a, a quick commentary, we, we all had issues with naming this panel Black Art Matters, um, but w I, I really think that this place wouldn't have been f as filled up as it is <laughs> if it wasn't called Black Art Matters. So thank you for coming. And um, I just want to say, is, is everyone familiar with Warren? who was up here taking my money just a minute ago. <laughs> He's the guy who has made SPX what it is, um, mm. what it is today. And um, <laughs> uh, before, you, before you clap, I'm, I, here's what I want to do is, um, it, it's, his, it's his birthday today. <gasps> and so oh. what I want to do is, after this, when we go up uh, into the hall, I want everyone to sing happy birthday. I'm going to get on the mic and get everybody to sing happy birthday to him. Uh -huh. But he's, he's the big 6 oh. Don't say anything. Big six -oh. So, and it's funny because we were just talking about um, how old everybody was. <laughs> and it, it, it really is true. Like, black don't crack. <laughs> Apparently, I thought, like, I Spike, I thought you were like, 12 and, <laughs> and she's yeah. Yeah. look up the age of Denzel Washington on Wikipedia one of these days that man is someone's grandpa yeah it's, it's pretty yeah. amazing but just quickly can everyone introduce themselves starting with Ron on the end I'm Ronald Wimberly what do you do uh, I'm a cartoonist uh, I did lighten up for the nib on medium I did a did something for the New Yorker a while ago about New Orleans. Um, Prince of Cats, uh, some She-Hulk. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. All right. There you go. <laughs> uh, sentences and an adaptation of something wicked this way comes for Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Nice. Spike? OK, now we're going to learn what real self-promotion is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Spike, C. Spike Trotman. I've been in webcomics since the turn of the century. I started out my career on the doomed pay comic site, girl o -Matic, and moved on to make Templar Arizona a long format slice of life alternate history comic. I've al I'm also the founder of Iron Circus Comics. It's called Iron Circus because I already own the domain. And I was an early adopter of Kickstarter. I ran my first project in 2009, and I've since made nearly half a million dollars in comics projects on the site, including Smut Peddler 2014, which was the most popular. I know, right? <laughs> Smut Peddler 2014, which was the most popular project on Kickstarter for a couple days running. So lady porn was beating out 3D printers and stuff. <laughs> and um, yeah, I have recently extended myself into publishing complete third-party creators, so I just released the Less Than Epic Adventures of TJ and Amal Omnibus by the incredibly brilliant and sensitive storyteller E.K. Weaver. That's why I sat on this side, though. You know? <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, for those familiar with my uh, nappy hour, I, I do this panel called the nappy hour, and it, we didn't call it the nappy hour but uh, here, but I'm going to use the same format, which is sort of like a pardon the interruption on ESPN type of thing, where uh, you get three minutes to speak, and uh, if you don't make it for the three minutes, uh, the kitchen timer goes off, and so you're going <laughs> to going to hear that, and uh, that shuts people up right away. <laughs> so it's, it seems to come in at just the right time, but Spike seems to somehow beat it all the time. She's very, <laughs> she's very good at working it. So, Daryl. My name is Io, Daryl Io, and uh, I do a bunch of comics. Um, um, mostly I did this thing called Little Garden, which um, is existed in several forms, uh, it, from just single panel illustrations to actual f comic stories. Uh, I also did a thing for the Nib recently. Uh, I think it was called it was called Lazy Thinking, and um, in just random short stories as well. Hi everyone, um, I'm Whit Taylor. Um, I guess like one of the first comics that I consider my first like real comic was 
2010. It was a comic I did that was autobio called Watermelon and Other Things That Make Me Uncomfortable as a Black Person. <laughs> <laughs> And um, after that, just kept doing some small press stuff, self-published, as well as uh, small press publishers. Um, 2013, got an Ignatz nomination for a series I did about my time in high school. And uh, thank you. Uh, I've been writing some stuff for The Nib uh, a few months ago, um, and also have written for The Comics Journal and Panel Patter doing some comics journalism. Excellent. And uh, my name is Keith Knight. Uh, I am uh, considered the old man at the con, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've been doing autobiographical comics for 25 years. And um, yeah, just uh, I'm still doing it. So, uh, <laughs> and I've actually I've actually raised a family on it. So you can uh, be broke and uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, um, wh what I want to do is jump right into it. Um, again, I repeat, I've been doing it for 25 years, and what's interesting to me is, is I love to see uh, so many young people uh, up here um, and, and doing it um, so many different ways, breaking into, into the industry and doing so many different styles and, and, and touching on, on so many different subjects. Ultimately, the race thing always pops up. Um, when I first started out, um, the only work I would get was February. I would get calls from editors <laughs> saying, hey, we'd like you for our February issue. <laughs> and, and so I, I wouldn't say, I would get the job and I wouldn't say anything about it. Um, and I would get it done and I'd pass it in. But um, at the end, when I got paid, when I made sure the check was on its way, I would say, I work the other 11 months of the year. <laughs> so, um, you know, touching on Ron's experience with uh, an editor and, and, you know, colorizing your characters, um, I'd like to hear a, a little bit more. Um, the, the comic is brilliant, but as we all know, as cartoonists, we always have to cut stuff out. Or is there anything interesting that, that wasn't said in your comic strip that, um, that had you know a, a nice juicy piece that you had to um, leave <laughs> on the editing floor. Well, I do a po I do a podcast with Julian Lytle here um, called Ignorant Bliss, and uh, something happened after the fact. So when the strip went up, I didn't mean for it to be like uh, gotcha journalism, like oh check it out, this editor said something that was you know racist. You know, mm -hmm. I don't care. Like the whole structure is racist. Like you're gonna you're gonna do something eventually. This racist is gonna show how racist it is. <laughs> you're like I don't think you're a bad person just because of that. Like I gotta work with you. Like I've been working in a racist environment my entire life. It's not like you know. But let's talk about it. So Axel said something about it. Uh, he glossed over it, and uh, NPR wanted to speak to the editor and. Uh, I never got a return email, and she wouldn't return, I guess, NPR's uh, email. So I said, whatever, and I moved along. Then when the Blade comic came out, I saw that it was staffed entirely by uh, white artists and a white writer, I believe. And um, the editor was the same editor <laughs> that asked me to lighten the skin of the character. I just thought it was funny. Because it's like, she won't have that problem again. <laughs> and that's, that's, the, that's the, the problem with the structure, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Is that it was good I was there to maybe call that into question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whether or not it was racist. Yeah. yeah. I don't think anybody likes to think of themselves as prejudiced, but we all grew up in a, a white supremacist society, you know? And it manifests in the behavior of people who aren't, you know, woke, so to speak. <laughs> And when it is called out, sometimes the reaction is just like, it's, it's really extreme, not because, you know, they're, I just think people are comfortable. I think people don't like, most people in comics, most people I speak to on a regular basis, consider themselves progressives. And when you let them know, by the way, you are not immune to the effects of the society that raised you, I think it makes them question themselves, and that's not necessarily something everyone's ready for. So they're, they're not grateful when you point certain things out. Because <laughs> it challenges their sense of self. 
Uh, have you guys had any uh, interesting experiences with editors or in the industry where they're like, oh, could you make this person this or that, or have you felt the need? Not an editor, but in my webcomic, there is a character, and his name is Scipio, and he is a six foot, 10 inch tall black man who is into Buddhism and ninja shows for children and wears kilts. And he's kind of like what would happen if a nerd decided he was going to get buff and handsome so he would get friends. And it worked, except he never stopped being a nerd. So he still has pretty dorky behavior. And on a forum, somebody was criticizing my webcomic and they said my characters were not believable. And Scipio came up and they said that is not what black people do. Uh, whoever wrote this character has never met a black person in their entire life. <laughs> this is a white idea, a white person's idea of what black people are. It's not realistic at all. And to that forum's credit, the post immediately after this post criticizing the character was simply a photograph of me <laughs> and the caption, wow, look how stupid you are. So, I mean, I, as an independent operator, I've never really kind of had editorial interference in anything I do, which is, quite frankly, how I like it. Daryl, you were just about to say something. I was going to say no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, when you do, like, mini comics and stuff or, like, like, the kind of web comics that I do, which are really sporadic. Nobody tells you what to do. Nobody tells me what mm -hmm. to do. Um, if somebody starts to tell you what to do, it confuses you, and you just um, you can just shut it down by um, I don't even want to say ignoring it. That's uh, that's that that's even giving it more credence than it had. Like they like people have no power over you because mm -hmm. like your money's coming from somewhere else. You're doing something else for a living, and then like you've got like. Um, yeah, um, editors don't like, I mean, not editors, but like just people can't tell me <laughs> what I'm allowed to do. Yeah. I mean, I can tell myself, I beat myself up all the time, but like, that's different. Like, other, <laughs> uh, nobody else can. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in terms of editorial stuff, no, but again, I do a lot of like mini <coughs> comics and things like that. And I did have somebody who was trying to get my one of my comics into stores a few years ago, and they were like, oh, well, this is, you're writing about race, so like I'm not sure that stores are gonna be interested in it. Um, but I'll try during February, I'll try to like slide it in <laughs> men, because then maybe they'll have some interest in it. That made me feel really like, I'm like, maybe I don't actually wanna work with you. And I, I went ahead and I did it, and it just felt, it felt yeah. strange. And I, I feel like the tide's turning on that now. It seems to be this, um, newer interest in diversity, which hopefully we can talk about a little bit more. But um, yeah, in terms of my own like projects, no, I, I haven't had a lot of issues with that. Mm. A quick note: they can ask you, but they can't. They can tell you, mm -hmm. but you don't have to do it. Mm. Like I didn't change the color of. The color. <laughs> right on. You know, like I mean, it's it may be why you don't see more of my work in that particular space, but mm -hmm. you know. I could give a fuck in the end, like you know. <laughs> and if I get a I chance admire to shine, your philosophy. like, if, no, you know, if I get one shot, it's got to be mm. a clean shot. You know, it's got to be what I want it to be. Mm. You know, rather than compromise over and over and over mm -hmm. again. So. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's really interesting because I started uh, my comics in this sort of alternative weekly realm, and. Um, You'd be surprised at, well, you wouldn't be surprised at how <laughs> <laughs> not diverse the alternative weekly market was in, in the 90s. It's, it, it's generally um, a, a, a white guy in his 50s and then like his 20-year-old advertising uh, mm -hmm. it, the girl that he brings, and, and it's them too. And, and he, uh, there was this one guy that came up to me when I had my strip there, and he's like, Keith, um, I love your stuff, but we don't have any black people in our town, so uh, we can't run your strip. <laughs> yeah. And I, I said, you know, I did a strip about this. I said, well, you're a white guy, and you like my strip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what makes you think other white people uh, <laughs> would, would like my strip? And uh, literally, he was like, you know, because I'm, I'm open-minded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So uh, sometimes comics just write themselves, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just amazing to me. So um, you know, one thing that had come up, I don't know if you saw the whole uh, Matt Damon uh, mm. white splaining thing. Uh, did you see that on, on HBO? The, no. I mean, I saw the headline. It was like Matt Damon explaining diversity to the one black um, uh, producer con uh, person that was on his team. Oh and she had raised concerns because they were doing like something about like a white guy marrying a black prostitute. And she's like, you know, um, we might want to look for a director of color or a, a woman like that might be able to handle this a little bit. And uh, Matt Damon just said to her, well, you know, um, it's not really important to have people of color behind the scenes, it's people in front of the camera, like it's to have diversity in front of the, he was explaining diversity to her, and it was just like. Well, I, I think he explained it exactly how it's perceived, like yeah. how it's been applied, even in our, in our work. Yeah. You know? So I don't think he was, I think he was wrong, but I think he was accurate. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, there's a story I like to tell that kind of explains the problem I have with you know a lack of diversity behind the scenes and I'm going to preface this by saying a lot of this stuff is very well intentioned but it's really easy to get wrong a friend took her child to the library and they took out a book which was about segregation because she want, and she was white and her kid was white and she wanted to like show her kid what segregation is and the story about segregation was about a little white boy who had a little brown friend, and the little white boy loved to swim at the public pool, but the little brown friend couldn't come swim with him because it was a segregated pool. And the focus of the book was how bad this made the little white boy feel <laughs> and how sad he was that the adults didn't see that we were all the same. Okay, um, first of all, we're not all the same. We're all different and that's okay, all right? Secondly, I'm super tired of hearing the stories of marginalized groups told through the lens of white or straight feeling or cis feelings about those groups. Um, I'm tired of hearing reading stories about like Jim Crow era South that is about how bad it makes the white people there feel. I'm tired of everything being filtered through like anachronistic single white guy who understands this is morally wrong. When I hear, when I want to read stories about marginalized groups, I look for stories where the authors have some sort of connection to the group they're writing about. I'm not saying, you know, Howard Zinn exists. I'm not saying that <laughs> white people out there who don't have a sympathetic, empathetic approach to telling marginalized people's stories that don't prioritize white feelings, I'm not saying they're not out there. I'm just saying it's a super easy trap to fall into, and I know that because I see it all the time. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's a great <laughs> point. I think we all like food, right? We all generally like food here. I just look at the size of me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just 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 put it in the context of food. Mm. It's like like I want my soul food. <laughs> made by people who, who, you know, whose culture, who makes faux food, <coughs> you know? I want my uh, French fries and fast food made by, like, you know, people who make fast food. I want, uh, I want all types of food, you know, I, I want the different culture, like, approach culturally, like, you approach your food. Well, I, I think if you take that a step further, if you're in an environment where all groups are equally um, re represented and uh, are exposed to a sort of the information that is required to create those things, then you may be less particular about it. So like, so if you were, you know, like if you grew up in a society, well, you could walk into a ramen, a ramen restaurant in Japan and you would assume that everyone there, you know, oh, well, everyone here make, is equally exposed to this information so they can make ramen, right? Like, but all of those, there could be as many, there's as much diversity among those people as there are, say, here. Mm -hmm. But maybe we perceive them as being similar, right? So mm -hmm. my point being that if we change what's happening behind the scenes so that there are editors, that there are writers, that, you know, hell, if you just bump into more people who are different than you, then, you know, from sheer observation, you'll be able to 
possibly imagine what their life is like. But the problem is, is that we live in a world where we have these separations, where we've created them, where the systems hold these separations in place. So like, I don't expect someone who's never really uh, had to deal with people who aren't, you know, who aren't like them to be able to represent them in fiction. I wouldn't expect it. Like, you just don't have the experience. Another thing is, um, I have been noticing more recently that there are a lot of people who are drawing characters of color, or drawing, um, you know, color uh, characters with brown skin or just different features, different hair. And I think that's great because I think it is good to have visual representation um, in comics. But I don't think that's a substitute for writing really nuanced and deeper characters mm -hmm. where it's based off of somebody's experience. So I mean, it's it's great to see that, but I don't think it's the same thing. It's not a replacement. Yeah, um, there is a difference, this seems like a good time to mention, there's a difference between writing a character who is black and writing the black character. Mm. And there's a thing I saw in a couple comics that like, oh, just crawls right up my ass, I can't deal with it. There'll be a cast of like really well-developed, usually mostly white characters that all have you know likes, dislikes, goals, worries, all kinds of standard issue important to fiction stuff. Human. Human stuff. <laughs> and then there will be a black character, and the black character, the summation of their character is I'm the black one. Mm. And it's at its most egregious where there will be the black character and it will be an acceptable parody of black people and usually black exploitation. Like the entire cast will be like, suburban white kids being very average and very suburban, and then the black character will be like Foxy Brown, oh no, I'm sorry, Golden Brown from like Aqua C Lab 2021 or something, or it'll be a Shaft reference, and it's completely anachronistic, and it doesn't belong there, and it's super fucking offensive, okay? There's, it's like you put a lot of work into developing everyone else, but, the black character is as shallow and stereotypical and you're as uninvested in it as you could possibly be because you've decided that was easy and you don't give them the same respect you give your other characters. Uh, and I, I can't fucking deal with that. I really can't. You know, I, I don't think it's necessarily an either or, uh, like you either do this or do that. I like the idea of if you're going to do a background scene, if you're going to do a, a, you know, mm -hmm. have a, a, a diverse mixture of characters. There are times when um, I'll do something and I'll, I think we, we learn this, like uh, when you draw, like, you know, a doctor uh, for a gag or something, mm -hmm. you, you immediately think of all the cartoons you were raised on. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, well, you know, white guy, a balding white guy, older yeah. white guy. And, and so you have to consciously yes. make that change. And, and it's not easy. I mean, and that, that's, that's mm -hmm. like it for, for, for everybody. You know, but you've you been to, to the doctor, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And Just, your doctor could be anything. anything yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has been. Yeah. But um, you have to consciously, you know, when you're raised on, like, uh, cartoons are different than reality. Yeah. And, and when you're raised on cartoons that were made in the 50s and were made yeah. in the 40s, and you're just like, oh, okay, that's what this is. Yeah, and, symbolic and, stuff. Yeah. yeah, symbolic stuff. So it's, it's, it, it, it's a conscious, the reason why I came up with the Cave Chronicles early on was I, in the early 90s, I was, um, I was a big hip hop fan and I wasn't seeing myself represented in the media. It's mm -hmm. like, if you're a hip hop fan, then you're a gangster, you're a thug or something like that. It's like, no, you can be a hip hop fan and, and be a, a nerd and into Star Wars and into other music yeah. and stuff like that. And so to do that was, at least back then, was like, oh wow. Like, I, mean, I knew, you know, I knew that a certain segment of the population would be on board. Yeah. but. What was surprising to to me was, you know, everyone started writing in, going, "Oh my goodness," uh, the the one type of reader that stood out was, um, and who the only one who would identify themselves by race and by age are fifty three year old white men. <laughs> and for some reason, fifty three year old white men would write to me and say, "I'm a fifty three year old white man." <laughs> And I can't believe that your comic strip is my favorite comic strip. <laughs> and I, I said, "Well, 
you know, yeah. Star That's Wars the... is my favorite movie, and it's done by a 53-year-old white man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so why would yeah. you find it? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would write something snark, and yeah. I'd never get written back. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's just important for people to, I, I, I know a lot of people want to just kind of hear a, sim, uh, a similar point of view. I, mm -hmm. think, I think generally that's why people, you know, right-wingers watch Fox News and then left-wingers watch something else. And, and you know, to they want to hear the echo chamber <laughs> coming back and everything. But um, most, uh, my best material comes from talking to people who I disagree with, mm. who people who give me a different angle on things yeah. that, um, you know, if m my my wife, when I show her my comics, if she doesn't get it, I know I've done a really good comic. <laughs> <laughs> like that's you know, when she gets it, I know it's not a great comic. So wow. it's 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 a weird thing. Does your wife know you feel this way? <laughs> oh, she to she she totally she looks at it. She's like, I, I don't get this. So like, I wanted I wanted to bring up something you brought. Something you said made me think of a unique problem uh, for. I guess creatives, any type of creative, not working in a um, who who maybe they're trying to do something different from the established sort of tropes or hi right, <laughs> and that is a unique. You said uh, symbols, right? Something that's always been unique, or what I imagine is unique for me is like, so I wanna I wanna make a cast of characters, right? But I look at the cast of characters that are uh, represented or out there. So a unique problem is like, well, a lot of the shorthand, like a very, very like in a very uh, rudimentary way, a lot of the shorthand, a lot of the language, the visual language, even the narrative language, it doesn't have like the tools or the colors or like the, you know, mm -hmm. that I need to tell my story. And I think that's something that if you're, if you're working and you're one of these people, I'm sure out here who wants to tell your story or a different story, I mean, be emboldened to create new symbols. tools, new yeah. symbols yeah. to tell your story. And that's something that like, a lot of people never touch on. It's like, yeah, you, you're starting from scratch. Like, your, your main character isn't the lantern-jawed, whatever. You can't use that silhouette. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, you can't use this, uh, this narrative device. Maybe it doesn't, you know, uh, even, it doesn't even apply to your life. Yeah, so I think be emboldened to think of new symbols. Yeah, don't be lazy. Don't, don't fall back on the tried and true. This actually makes me think of something Lisa Hanawalt. All right, Lisa Hanawalt is a cartoonist. She did a book a while back called My Dumb Dirty Eyes, and she is also the character designer for BoJack Horseman. And when she was doing character design, she turned them in, and she'd get responses like, okay, well, this is really good, but I think the bartender here should be, you make it a female elephant, and I think it should be a male elephant. And she would just go, why? And the guys she was working with realized they didn't have a good reason why. They were just saying it. And that helped them like sort of stop and think for a moment. And just like, oh, there's, I have no reason to want this bartender or this person or that person to be a dude. It's just that's, I'm, I'm on autopilot. You know, they're not purposely attempting to make as few women, mm. female characters as possible. It's just they're not thinking and you have to be more aware than like the average person to really put the effort in to make sure that you don't sink into autopilot and mm -hmm. you don't go the easy route too when you're doing stuff. So. And reading too. I, yeah. One of the things is like when looking at something, right? Uh -huh. I may have an initial reaction to it. And then I have to say like, well, do I feel this way because of the work or do I feel this way because I've been trained by like either academic or a Western eye to view a certain craft or a certain approach to the medium in a certain way. Yeah. So I think as an audience and for all of us to push the medium, like it's important to maybe ask those questions and to think about uh, how we're viewing symbols and what we're conditioned to see as like, you know, like a British accent. Oh, that guy knows what they're talking about. Yeah. You, know what I mean? like, you can apply the same thing to Marx <coughs> or to, you know, uh, design, you know, yeah. so something to think about. You guys talk. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, so I think this is also applicable to just like marketing and distribution as well. I think that often uh, when you're making comics that um, might 
not have as wide of an audience, you have to make the extra effort to get it out there, and that's something that yeah. I've struggled with for a while. Um, I think also being in doing autobio, which for a lot of people, people see autobio as like the entryway into comics. It's like anybody can do it. You just write about yourself. How hard is that? <laughs> um, but that also comes with a lot of other difficulties because there's a lot of people doing it, and also I think with autobio, um, people are assuming that they're gonna buy something that they can have some type of commonality with. So if race becomes part of that, people might not feel, or might be concerned that their experiences might differ and there might be a little bit of an issue in terms of like consuming that. And that's, that's something that I feel like I've encountered yeah. a little bit. So um, I've just found it a little bit more difficult in terms of having to like get my stuff out there. Um, Daryl, what do you, how about you? With your many comics. <laughs> what are you talking about? Which part of it? I'm, I'm saying like. <laughs> I mean. Like, I'm saying with mini comics, have you like had to have any other strategies that you've had to come up with in order to get them out there? Um. Well. Uh, see, the mini comic strategy. I don't know. I just sort of like uh, knew about mini comics and just uh, made them and assumed that they were just as good as anyone else's, mm. and I didn't actually. Um, have a whole lot of um, what's the word doubt um, about <laughs> like <laughs> I'm serious like <laughs> like I don't like like I was having a conversation about how um, you know some of my some some you know some cartoons I had tried to sell didn't really s didn't sell and it was like well when you're like when you were 23 you probably weren't that good and I was like. You're right. I knew that, though, but I also didn't care. I just yeah. took the opportunity. I just said, well, I can get this meeting done. I'm just going to go and do it. And uh, it's probably going to get rejected, obviously. Obvi I mean, it's like pretty obvious that you're probably going to get rejected when you try to do anything. And so I'm not like delusional or anything. But it's like I also wasn't afraid to like walk into any like um, – like mainstream publisher or mainstream publication and just say this is the stuff that I do and they'll be like I don't get it and I don't tell them that I think that there's something wrong with them <laughs> because like it's very easy to get in my opinion but it's also very <laughs> like like the the tough part is like not calling somebody like to their face like ignorant like mm -hmm. like and when I say ignorant, I mean just like you just don't even know how to look at a picture and, and <laughs> interpret it into something that can be like useful to your publication. So I like, you know, it, it, it does get very, um, I mean, that part of marketing, I guess, is, is challenging. But like, like that's not a, I don't know. I, 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 sometimes I think it, it, if it is a race thing, it's like, it, it's, it's in the fact that like, like, uh, like, I was exposed, like I wasn't exposed to the same type of like self-doubt culture that I see that comes out of a lot of other, like a lot of the mainstream white American culture. I came, like, I grew up, I came late to it, but I came into hip hop, and I like, like. I, like I grew up listening to people who were basically invincible and <laughs> couldn't die. And the first time, like when, like seriously, when Tupac got murdered, nobody cared. Nobody thought that he actually died. They really didn't believe it because, like, like, I can confirm like that. you believe in yourself so much that you project a, a sense of um, confidence that, that like if. It even like even if your numbers aren't yeah. not matching, yeah, I see you, I see it. <laughs> but even when your numbers are not matching up to your expectations, you still just sort of shrug your shoulders and say, "I know I'm good, though." So you know, <laughs> and then you pack your stuff and go home. It's not really that big of a deal, I guess, to me at least. But um, I'm totally insecure, so that's totally not how I feel. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Um, um, I just want to add really quick that I think there's this sort of persistent subconscious belief, and I'm not saying. Finish it. Finish your sentence. Okay. Finish a, your person, sentence. A, a persistent subconscious belief. I don't think a lot of people are aware they even have it, but they think that there are experiences and there are black experiences, and black experiences cannot be universal the same way white experiences are. So if a black person is doing autobio, a white person might automatically assume it's something that they won't be able to relate to, that a black person's life is completely alien and different from anything they might experience. And it's, it sort of comes from that delusion that to be white is to be politically and socially neutral. What, I mean, it's, no, it's completely not. If anyone here believes that, you're wrong. And 
the idea that blackness is is this alien concept. It's the same reason that movies get whitewashed and um, characters in, oh gosh, I don't know, The Hunger Games turn out a little lighter than they should have been because it's this persistent sort of belief that, you know, empathy is much more difficult when you're trying to empathize with a black person because it's their experiences are different, their lives are different, what they like and what they do and what they want is different, and it's it's really not. Yeah, it really isn't. Um, we uh, are going to do a Q&A um, really quickly, but I just want to know, you know, two things, because you talked about the industry and starting out and blah, blah, blah. Two pieces of advice from each one of you on succeeding in the industry, because I know, you know there's a lot of artists here, and it's like, you know, these guys, uh, you've accomplished a lot with... Uh, what you've done, and so two pieces of advice. Start so, from uh, that end. This <laughs> from this end, oh, okay. Um, for me, um, I think it's persistence. I think it's just uh, as being the old man at the con. If you're around long enough, yeah, uh, people will realize, oh wow, he's not going away. Maybe I will check out his <laughs> comics. Seriously. Um, so that's that's a huge thing. But also, um, you know, totally be open to learning. Um, from everybody and um, I started out looking at people who've been in the business longer than me but honestly I find myself getting learning from people like Spike uh, learning from people half my age like in this age of, of social media and all this stuff I'm learning so much um, from from everybody at this table and just everybody in the audience just how they make it and you have to be able to sort of reboot every six months as far as uh, doing a, uh, making this a career because there's so many different avenues online and, and not just online but in, you know, I do slideshows and I do uh, gallery shows and all these different things. Be open to it and uh, there's no one way to accomplish uh, a career in cartooning. A thousand percent true. Um, for one, I, I love the, the term uh, praise and blame are all the same, meaning that, like, you know, if you're sending out your comics for review or you're getting feedback from people, like, don't let people, like, you know, kissing your ass go to your head and don't let people telling you you're terrible, like, mm. bring you down, you know? It's like, you gotta just try to stay balanced and, like, think about, like, why you're doing it. You're doing it because you enjoy doing it because it brings some type of meaning to your life. So, like, if you're getting wrapped up in what other people are saying, it's just really gonna be a waste of time. Um, other, I would say, is self-care, and part of self-care being don't compare yourself to what other people are doing because you honestly have no clue, like, what's behind that or, like, what's coming around for you or somebody else. Um, and just doing what feels comfortable. If, like, you don't want to use social media as much or you want to use it more or if you want to go to shows or you want to do this or that, like, you have to kind of do what you want that makes you feel like you can have a sustainable career and a healthy life. Mm. Career advice is like, I went to my first comic show in New York, I'm from New York, I went to MoCA uh, and got in a car accident, Ooh. still went to the show, <laughs> jumped out of the car with the bumper hanging off, mm -hmm. sold 17 copies of my comic and walked away feeling good and that's because I didn't care, like I felt like, oh, also you don't, you only get one chance to like not to like surprise people or like what would it be like if I was just a person and no and I didn't like try to make a big deal out of it I sold 17 copies of a comic that nobody heard of at uh in a major city and after that I said that's my baseline and it only you know I can only do like you can only do like better from there like you can only like after that is like people know you uh, people uh, establish a, a pattern, which is to say, you did this this time, this this time. I like this better. You're getting better, or things like that. Um, you you start to get a. You have to put it into a sense of like uh, instead of like thinking about failure, like you can't like. I mean, oh, well, it's, this is really particular to comics. You can't fail in comics. It's not possible because there's not enough money to actually constitute a <laughs> failure, <laughs> like. I, no, I once heard a pal of mine was accused of being a failed mini comics artist, and that really pissed. <laughs> like, I took I took personal offense because you can't fail at mini comics. You can stop <laughs> making mini comics. You can decide, to, like, you cannot fail. It's impossible because it's something that you're like, like the top mini comics person in the entire in the entire world doesn't make a living doing 
just mini comics. It's not possible to then therefore fail at mini comics. <laughs> so, so, so as far as career advice, it's like all you can do is succeed. All you can do is just make your stuff. And like you were saying, like, like just get, keep coming out there. And, and if people ignore you at first, after a while, they can't ignore you because you just keep coming back. And then it's just like, okay, you're just this person who just is part of the landscape. I wonder what this person's about. Boom. Uh, <laughs> nicely done. Okay, I am going to paraphrase Jean Yang here to address a concern I see expressed by a lot of young creative people. In an environment that is increasingly, you know, aware of diversity and different voices and that has sort of had an effect that some people have told me that they are afraid to write about experiences or characters that are unlike themselves. Uh, and the Gene Yang part comes in because he has said, if you are approaching subject matter or characters who you have you know, no personal experience with and you want to write them in a realistic way, approach it with curiosity and humility. Do your research and realize someone will probably complain no matter what. All you can do is your best. And if I'm going to get shit for not knowing what black people are like, there is no hope for any of you. <laughs> okay? And number two is, is easier and easier to function as an independent creator these days. Uh, I don't publish with anyone but myself for the time being. I am approached by people to publish with them, and that's very nice. But um, I built my career on doing everything alone. So I've, I've heard the excuse that, yeah, you know, the February work sucks, but as a black creator, it's what's offered to me and I have to do it and blah, blah, blah. No, you don't have to do anything. To paraphrase Langston Hughes, you ain't gotta do shit except stay black and die. <laughs> so basically if... And even MJ. Yeah, I know, and even Michael Jackson, <laughs> right. <laughs> Enough tubes of that weird cream from India and you don't even have to go through with the stay black part. But, <laughs> but yeah, um, if what you're hearing, for example, um, from mainstream editors, and I know some really weird problematic stuff has hit the press lately that might make you, you know, not willing to work with certain people, don't think you have to. You can make a comic, stick it on Tumblr, plug away at it for two or three years until you have enough pages for a Kickstarter and go for it. You know, your career, like all comics careers, will be a slow burn. And it'll be persistence, and it'll be self-promotion, and it'll be just getting the work done. That's what makes comic careers, not discovery these days. Yeah. Brian. I'm gonna tell you stuff like that I have trouble with. <coughs> well, first part being like, it's still a business, you know? So like, you know, keep, keep your check stubs. Sorry. Yeah, man. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> keep keep your check stubs. You know, like keep your keep your pa paperwork together. Um, yeah, and know that like everybody out here is like, yo, I've been doing it for a little bit. You know, like I got big names on my you know in my portfolio, and like I still struggle. You know, a lot of people who get by to get by would help. You know, a lot of the people that you know they put out their little independent project, My Boring Life comic, you know, to get to that point. No, 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 but I'm not even talking, you know, I'm talking oh, about no, like. I, I thought you were talking about Daryl. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I gotta be like that. Me, I'm not talking about him. I'm talking about like, you know, I'm talking about fanographics type books. You know what I mean? Oh, like, with a name and everything. You know, like their parents paid for that. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like, Ronald. They, you know, <laughs> no. I borrow grocery money from my mother like every once in a while. Like comics can be rough, you know, and like don't believe anyone's fantasy that they put forward like, oh yeah, we just out here doing art. And like, yeah, it's for the art. And like, you know, and you're sitting here starving because you think that's what it is, but it's like, no, these yeah. people, their uncle is rich. You know what I mean? Like, don't, don't believe the hype of other people's hustle. Stay on your hustle, you know, do what you can to get by. If you gotta have an extra job, that's part of the hustle, that's okay. Like, just don't believe other people's illusion. Like, we're all out here trying to put the work out. Yeah. And you can hold on to your integrity if you're not, like, believing some fantasy, like, oh, I had to take this job. Yeah, you took the job, and then you did your stuff, you know? That's, I mean, that's my little bit of Can advice. I jump in for a sec? Yeah, yeah, a lot of cartoonists have day jobs, probably like most cartoonists, tons, so tons. often not related to comics at all. 
Yeah. Or they marry rich, which oh, I yeah. marry rich. Like they marry rich. rich. Marry rich. If you, you never can hear about it. Some family that yeah, marry a cartoon that their kids gonna marry a cartoonist. That's that's like big. You names. deserve that money. Yeah. Big if you names. You can convince somebody. <laughs> big <laughs> names. Okay. So listen, we have five minutes. If if we can get three. Uh, questions you have to get come up here to the microphone and ask the, whoever gets up there first uh, the three questions <laughs> is a raise all right um i just want to say um yo ulysses don't kill anybody man. and someone had, <laughs> someone had mentioned something Hi, ulysses. <laughs> i just want to mention really quickly uh to give props to george harriman who uh, yes. you know the reason why the ignatz award is named the ignatz award is for the guy who who created Ignatz. Mm. Easily German. two generations ahead of his time. Yes, mm. and, and he, he was a black man, a closeted black man, to make it in the industry. But, yeah. uh, you know, he is, uh, you know, we want to give props to George Harriman. Yeah. Um, quickly. Hey, so, sorry, didn't mean to race up here. <laughs> but, one, I, work in the, I work in the comics industry, and one of the things you guys have said multiple times is they didn't email me back again, or they didn't write me back again. Uh-huh. As a professional comic book artist, I'm Latino, I'm mixed race. How do you deal with people who are your peers, are often your friends, how do you deal with the silence of your peers? Um, you're talking about like white silence in the face of yeah. racial prejudice? Like, like you know, uh -huh. a lot of times I feel like at like shows like this or other conventions, mm -hmm. you, this will be like the only area that people are talking about this. And then once we get back out there, it's gonna be silence again. Yeah. I I know. don't care. Yeah. <laughs> How much you? Yeah. yeah seriously, I talk enough for everybody. <laughs> I mean, Which is, you should fo follow Daryl on Twitter. Seriously. You should follow Daryl on Twitter. <laughs> 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 like, when white people don't talk about it, racial issues, that's okay. We're talking about them. But it's cool that you're listening. That's nice. We like that. But like, you don't actually have to. You don't actually have to say anything. You don't have to jump in. You don't have to help. There's nothing you can do to help. I mean, there's something you can do to help. You can fix. You can do. You can do your part to fix yeah. systemic problems, whether it's politically or socially in your area. But as far as having a conversation, there's really nothing you can do to jump in when I'm talking and. Um, and actually like uh, improve the situation. You could just sort of be like, I mean, if you want to do something, you can hit that retweet button and make more people yeah. see it. Yeah. But like seriously, like when like, when I mean like everybody has a microphone on Twitter and mm -hmm. Tumblr and not Facebook, don't use Facebook, but like, um, <laughs> but like, um, but like everybody has a microphone, everybody has a stage, so it's not as though like, yeah. The, you need to be a part of their conversation. You have your own microphone, use it, and you don't have to contribute to what when somebody else is saying something. Mm -hmm. You could just like you could just like appreciate it and learn from it. And I just, and I'm silent on a lot of things that mm -hmm. don't that aren't about me. And that is how like and you know I I, I being silent on them is not ignoring them. It's just it's knowing that you don't know enough to talk. Mm -hmm. and knowing that you can learn something and maybe in your private life when you have the opportunity to influence actual people instead yeah. of the echo chamber, then you can put what you've learned from the internet, what you've yeah. learned from people who, who live those lives that you don't live, then you can put that into motion by telling them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, There's something I've heard about that's referred to as the Hannibal effect. Uh, not the TV show, the comedian. Um, Bill Cosby was accused of terrible things for many, many, many years, except his accusers were women. And then Hannibal Buress said something, and he's like, this is super fucked up, why aren't we doing anything about it? And suddenly there was legitimacy, legitimacy to the conversation. And that is what happens when you have privilege. Hannibal had male privilege, so suddenly his word was worth more. In situations in your private life, in situations in your professional life, if you are a person with privilege, if you have white privilege, if you have male privilege, if you have straight privilege, cis privilege, all kinds of things, you do have a power that people who are from disenfranchised or marginalized groups do not have, and your voice might be listened to in situations where the voices of those people, people refuse to hear them. So when you see fucked up stuff going on, if you can do something about it, I would not hold it against you if you did. 
You know, if you are standing in line with a friend who is brown and that friend is being hassled by store security in a way you weren't being hassled, if you said something like, why didn't you treat me that way? Well, how are we different? That would be worth doing. Mm -hmm. If you are on Twitter and you follow brown people who are saying important things about, you know, brown situations, <laughs> a retweet wouldn't hurt because maybe that's putting it in a timeline of someone who wouldn't follow me because maybe they're under the impressions we wouldn't have anything in common. Okay, quick. We got two more, uh, two yeah. more minutes, I, two more questions. I have an important, important caveat, though. Yes. Um, when the police are involved, like, mm -hmm. if you guys are about to get out of the location of the police, don't, don't sacrifice, don't like say shit to the police, though. Yeah. Like, yo, seriously, <laughs> that is you, a serious thing. You, you, they, and your, you and your black friend get the fuck up out of there. Like, <laughs> yo, if the like, police are talking to your black friend and, and about to do something to your black friend, stay cool. Stay cool. Your black friend is staying cool. Stay cool. He stay knows stay what cool. he has to do yes. to get out of that situation. Don't be like, oh, I'm going to get your badge number. Yeah. I, I can't believe what you're doing here because you about to get your friend killed. Yeah. <laughs> Important um, caveat. I, yes. I just want to say, yeah. we're not going to make it. I don't think we're going to make it There's to you. There is no question that I have that is more important than <laughs> okay. advice. Wit's going to say something, and, and then okay. you guys, could, can you come up after and just ask us, like, yeah. personally? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of the last question, it made me think of this article that was recently on BuzzFeed, and you know, BuzzFeed usually has a lot of trash, but like this was one of the, <laughs> the rare ones where it was pretty good. It was this girl, um, she was an Asian American writer who went to school, University of Wisconsin, and she was talking about, you know, the best American poetry scandal with the artist who took, it was actually his high school uh, classmates oh, uh, yes. name, an Asian American woman and all of that. And she was talking about how, you know, she went to this school for writing and in the years past, like all of her white classmates were the ones who got published, or the ones who went on to get all these opportunities. And she was getting asked to do work for free, to be in diversity panels, to be asked to comment when there was some type of political issue, when there was some type of, yeah. you know, police brutality, something like that. And she's like, I'm tired of it. She's like... And I understand what, what that feels like. I'm sure a lot of us do. Um, and so I think that these conversations come up. Like there are situations where contemporaries, where our peers get published, where we don't, where mm -hmm. we send in stuff and we send in our work and we get told either we don't get responded to or we get some type of like brush off or something that's nicely put to say that it's not the type of material they're looking for. So these things do happen and these conversations and these awkward situations happen. But like everyone, everyone's saying it exists. We have to acknowledge that that it exists, and you don't have to try to make us feel better about it. I think that's probably the worst yeah. uh, way to go about it. Okay, and the final note on, on black art matters. Uh, I don't want anyone to leave here and didn't go, oh, it ain't going to be a white art matters panel. <laughs> <laughs> the black art matters and the black life matters movement, oh, if some actor actually put it best. No one sits there and gets mad when someone posts um, save the rainforest. No, that doesn't mean fuck the other forest. <laughs> <laughs> it means that there is a crisis going on with the rainforest. And there is a crisis going on with black lives. And that's why that exists. So if anyone of your, especially white people, because I know you'll come across white people, they, what, what is yeah. talking about? you say that to them, yeah. OK? <laughs> If you take anything from this panel, you say that yeah. for, to them. I want to thank everybody here, Ron, Spike, Daryl, Witt. I'm Keith Knight. <laughs>